Hello, folk of the internet, and welcome to my exhausted existence. Today, we're going to be talking about every single coping mechanism that I know for when the pain is bad. The stuff I'm going to be talking about in this video is specifically what works for me, so, you know, the usual sort of disclaimer and stuff. I'm not a doctor, even if my advice may be more useful than that of a doctor, and uh, my conditions may not necessarily map perfectly onto everyone. So my conditions are EDS and fibromyalgia primarily. You can watch my last video on disability if you want to learn more about that. So um, if you have either of those conditions, this will probably be useful for you. And maybe if you have similar conditions like or like similar affected areas, like if you have arthritis in your hands, although like I say, um, if, if you have a different condition, it may not map on perfectly, and even if you have the same conditions, it may not map on perfectly, because everybody's different, and, um, you know, different people that need different things. So today we're going to be talking specifically about what to do when the pain is acute, so like, you're hurting and you need it to stop now. Um, there's also, I also want to talk about uh, long-term um, management strategies, but that will be in the next video. And I'm also not going to be touching on any of the more like psychological stuff, which is also extremely important, but it needs a whole video of its own. So with that all out of the way, let's get started. Splints and gloves. First off, splints. Uh, I have two different types on right now. Basically just this one is a cheaper one. I, it was about like six quid. Uh, I think, and this one was like 25 quid. This one is like, it's kind of a wire uh, that wraps around the finger and basically kind of stops it moving very much at all. And this one is a kind of like a hinge that goes under the finger and and goes there and basically prevents you from hyperextending it. The, the point with both of these is to stop you hyperextending. They're both quite good, to be honest. If you can't afford ones like this, ones like this are definitely a good um, alternative. This one is slightly better overall, like in part, just because like it's not as destructible. Like this one, it's kind of like a coil. So as you can see, if you like sat on that, you know, it's it's not very strong and then it's it's it's, it's gone. It also the way it's designed, it kind of gets caught in your hair and stuff. But on the other hand, um, because this one um, allows you full range of movement besides hyperextending, if you kind of actually don't want the joint to move but at all for a bit because, or like very little because it's, it's hurting a lot, then this one is actually better because it kind of just blocks, it kind of hinders your movement more significantly. Um, so it really just depends on what you want, but I have gone for more of these um, and I've got uh, more arriving in the post. Links to uh, where I've bought these and every every other product that I mention in this video will be in the description. Okay, next, uh, gloves and bandages. I wear these in basically every video. This is the most common type of glove that I use. It has fingers and um, and it's long. For me, it has to have fingers in order to work the majority of the time just for warmth purposes basically like the more common type that you will find is um gloves that are more like this so that's it's like an arm warmer rather than a than a glove these are generally like probably my least used types because because this this opening at the end it doesn't like it doesn't help for warmth uh yeah don't use these very often now these are uh compression gloves which are basically designed specifically for people with arthritis or ehlers danlos or whatever, whereas these are not, I just find them useful. These are tight, they're like super, like they're designed to like, you know, um, just, just compress the hand. I don't know how they work. I don't know how compression gloves stop your hands hurting as much, but they do. These, I, again, I don't use them quite as much because uh, the, your hands tend to get quite sweaty in them because they're very uh, tight. They only come up to about here, so I'd have to like use them in combination with one of these in order to like get the kind of warmth that I needed out of them which is it looks cool but it's a right faff so this is my most commonly used type it's not specifically designed for EDS the type of glove it is is like a long half finger glove and that's the best type that I have found in general obviously not in peak summer oh yeah there's one more when it is peak summer or if you just need multiple layers which which I did sometimes um when my when my pain was like super bad in my hands then you just want like a sort of basic tubey grip it keeps your whole hand free and just just keeps this area uh, compressed that's good if it's too hot or if you just don't you know you just don't need the whole glove um, and then if you need to like double up you can 
you can do that. I find that like a large part of being disabled in this kind of way is basically creating a kind of like exoskeleton for yourself because your internal one doesn't work very well and that's kind of what gloves and splints are for. Another thing that sort of goes in this section but not exactly is a uh, physio tape. So I used to use this a lot. I haven't needed to for a while actually. Although that having said I could I could do with someone like my back and shoulders. My arms generally aren't quite as bad as they used to be. Basically uh, for, for the forearm what you'd want to do is get that and apply it here. Don't unpeel the sticky bit and the tape before you apply it. Apply it like gradually, like like you're, you're applying sellotape or something and then cut it because otherwise you're just going to end up with this mess that sticks to itself. So you want to apply it like from there and then along the arm and kind of up, like slightly up the bicep and then cut it. That's super useful. Again, I don't know how precisely it works. It, uh, I think it's something to do with like lifting the skin up so blood can flow more easily or something. It's just, it works really well. It's really useful. Um, there's, I don't remember all the different ways to put it on, um, but there's tons of guides on the internet. So that can be useful for like the underside of the arm. It can be useful for going over the arm. Also, if you um, have pain in your back, um, then, uh, and your shoulders, which you probably will if you have uh, problems like this, then um, there's ways that you can apply it there that are super useful and I used to have it um, on my back a lot. Another thing that I've seen that looks like potentially useful um, but I haven't tried it yet is uh, like the medical corset to kind of, yeah, basically do the same kind of exoskeleton thing around your waist and support all those um, back muscles, especially if you have a spine like I do that curves like slightly too much inwards or that has some other kind of like issue uh, that might be useful but I don't know, I haven't personally tried it yet. Uh, if you have, let me know how it went in the comments. Drugs and gels. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is basic painkillers. Paracetamol, ibuprofen. Like, it sounds obvious, but just taking like these basic, you know, over-the-counter medications is really easy to forget when you're in pain kind of all the time. I guess the idea with painkillers is that you should only take them when you're in pain, and so if you're in pain kind of all the time, it's like, well, that's your normal, so surely you shouldn't have to medicate your normal. I guess. It's okay to be reliant on painkillers if someone who suffers from chronic depression needs to be constantly on antidepressants then someone who has chronic pain may need to be constantly on painkillers. So yeah, if you have issues with like remembering to take just normal painkillers when you're in pain, because they can make quite a lot of difference, then maybe set up like a reminder or get another person to tell you. Obviously I'm not saying to just take them if you don't need them, but to acknowledge that if you are in pain that's enough reason to take a painkiller. These kinds of like over-the-counter painkillers can help bring the pain to a more manageable level, but sometimes when it's very severe, that's not enough. And that's where my favorite drug comes in. So this is gabapentin. They don't normally give it out in boxes this big, but they've decided I'm very responsible, so it's okay. Basically, um, gabapentin works uh, in a similar kind of a way to like an opiate, I believe. Pain actually works kind of on two levels. There's like the first level where um, like the sensation of pain happens and then there's the second level where your brain tells you that that it is bad. So your basic um, painkillers work basically by like bringing down that first level of pain so you just don't feel the pain as much in the first place. But drugs like gabapentin and pogabalin, I believe, work by uh, not by getting rid of like the sensation of pain at all but just by altering the way you feel about it. So basically you can be sitting around in quite a high amount of pain and just not really care. It's really good, it just chills you out so much. Um, I notice slightly different effects every time um, I take it. Uh, the first time I took it, I had just a sort of full-on like euphoria experience, which was particularly odd because I was in uh, just such an extreme level of pain at the time. That was the time that like my neck disc popped out and that was why they gave me uh, the gabapentin. I was doing things like like I had a shower and was like, 
this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It just really like heightened uh, like good sensations and stuff. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've never had uh, that kind of experience on it since, but it does really work for just chilling you out when you're having like a heightened and tense and horrible pain day. Uh, it is addictive, as you can imagine, from something that has like the potential to give you euphoric properties, or rather like people take it sort of recreationally and then they can get addicted. Uh, luckily for me, if I take it for more than like a week, I get depressed. It means there's no incentive to take it for too long, so uh, I now have a nice backup box of it for whenever the pain is really, really bad. Would highly recommend that anybody who suffers from chronic pain just has has a stash of it just just for emergencies. Now, a slightly tricky one I wanted to talk about today is uh, progesterone. Progesterone is released in very high amounts in the body during pregnancy, and one of its functions is to basically like loosen the joints so that the baby can come out more easily. So as you can imagine, if you're someone who already has hypermobile joints, then having extra progesterone floating around in your system is not very good. Unfortunately, the progesterone is one of the primary components of, I think, all hormone-based contraceptives, at least it definitely was the last time I checked, which of course many people take to alleviate dysphoria if, you know, they don't want to have periods. And uh, you may also be taking progesterone, of course, if you don't have boobs and you want to grow some. I think in like the latter case, it's probably less likely to be a problem because the issue is to do with there being too much progesterone in the system, but don't quote me on that, I don't know. Not one of my doctors in many years mentioned that progesterone could be having a loosening effect on my joints, um, and it was only after my mum suggested it as a kind of as an offhand thing, like, oh, you might want to try this, um, that I tested coming off progesterone and I didn't expect there to be really much difference, but after just a week of not being on it, I had my first day in months where I woke up and I just wasn't in any pain. It's difficult because obviously um, a lot of people take progesterone to alleviate dysphoria, so it's kind of like a toss-up between one health thing and another. It might be um, difficult to give up and like that's understandable. Also it may not even be effective for you because it's not like, it's not just a clear open and shut case. It's a very sort of under-researched area of medicine, as contraceptives are just generally kind of ignored or if there's like bad health effects like nobody really cares. It's definitely not something that affects everybody and there's also some research suggesting that it may even help people who have arthritis, which is quite a different thing, but uh, you know, unfortunate if you have both. It's also such an everyday thing that people uh, generally just don't really think about it, so I'm just kind of putting it out there as a potential factor for hypermobile people in particular to consider. Also don't have kids. Just in general, don't have kids. Now, if you have trouble sleeping, I have tried, I feel, I feel really weird just with so many, like, pills in this video. Is, is this even legal? Am I allowed to do this? I have tried two different things. I've tried amitriptyline, which is what I got put on first, and promethazine, uh, which I got put on later. Um, amitriptyline, it will make you go to, well, actually, I can't guarantee that. Like, for some people, it actually does the opposite and gives them insomnia. So, like, it made me go to sleep. It's very good for that, but the trouble is it worked almost, like, a little too well. It really zonked me, like, to the point that, like, when I came off it, I kind of became, like, fully awake for the first time. It was like there was a bit of my brain that had just never fully woken up while I was on this, this medication. They tend to give you this if you have pain issues as well, because it can help to reduce just overall pain in the body. I personally didn't find it to have that effect. It just helped me sleep. So eventually I switched to this because I wanted something that didn't zonk me so badly during the day. And this is generally better for people whose sleep issues are more caused by anxiety rather than by um, physical pain, keeping them up at night. And uh, that's definitely maps onto onto my sleep, sleep problems. So yeah, this is generally just the better option for me because it, it helped me sleep, but it doesn't have quite the same like zonking effect the next day. It's still a bit zonking, but not as much. It, it says to not take it 
for over a week, but uh, most doctors um, are actually like, it's a very mild, it's just an antihistamine and it can be taken for longer than that with no real adverse side effects. Obviously you want to try coming off it whenever you can, so I don't take it every single day, but I'm also not like scared to take it for more than a week should I need to. Okay, next I'm going to talk about like heat and cold gels. I've tried a variety of them out, including like um, gel ibuprofen. None of them have worked as well as this. This is Pidantak stuff, um, which is like some kind of Ayurvedic stuff that my mum got from India. It's really good. I, again, like, I don't know how it works, but it has, it just feels amazing. It's got some kind of like, some relative of the garlic plant in it. It has this really weird smell. It smells like medicinal and garlicky at the same time. So it's it's kind of gross, like at least at first, but now I love the smell because I associate it with healing. And I, I think you can get it just on Amazon, but I'm not sure. I will search for it and post it in the description because it is amazing stuff. Again, like, if anyone hears the word like Ayurvedic and is like, <gasps> I don't know why that works as much as like anything else, but they didn't know how acupuncture worked for a long time, but the evidence that it did kept piling up and now Western scientists have theories and they offer it on the NHS. Whether or not that service is actually accessible to most of the general public is an entirely different matter. I think the subject of like how Western medicine is held up as like 100% true and correct all the time, whereas everything else is just automatically snake oil, is kind of a whole video topic in itself. But put simply, uh, do be critical in general, of course, of like everything, there's a lot of nonsense out there, but if you assume that the positive effect of Chinese or Indian medicine must be placebo because we don't understand how it works, that's just racism. Like, there are a lot of medicines that have worked in the West for a very long time before people actually understood why. There is plenty that Western doctors and scientists do not yet understand, and nobody knows that better than sufferers of fibromyalgia and EDS. Ice and heat. So, one of the things that I found most useful when um, my arms were in a really, really bad way and just, just horrible, horrible pain is um, ice packs. I use these ones. They're just actually for lunch boxes, but I find them useful because they're kind of flexible and they can, you know, you can, you can adjust them around your arm as needed. I've never actually found one that's designed for your body that works as well as these. Um, if, if anyone does have any recommendations, let me know. What you want to do is you want to have a bit of fabric covering your skin. So if you're not wearing a glove like this, then make sure you have like a, a just a, a thin bit of like a t-shirt or something covering it. This one's not been in the freezer put it in the freezer, obviously. Uh, 10 minutes on, leave the arm, just don't try and do things with the arm while you're doing that, just watch TV or something. Um, and then like at least 20 minutes off, and then 10 minutes on again, just repeat it as you need. This is uh, mostly useful for repetitive strain type stuff. Again, I haven't had to do this in a while because I don't do as much like things to injure myself that way as I used to, like writing or playing guitar or, or um, or, or whatever. I know that this sounds like it contradicts what I said in my last video about cold being bad for me, but for some reason the acute application of cold on a specific painful area does not cause problems and in fact uh, it just well it has a completely different effect to just overall um, environment being cold. I, I don't know why. It's honestly like this disease wants us to sound like we're lying. In general, you want a warm environment. Like, turn the heating on. If you can afford it, turn the heating on. And if you can, like, oh, sort of afford it, but like, oh, do you really want to be spending the money on that? Do spend the money on that, because if you hurt your health by not having the heating on, then you won't be able to earn the money to pay for the heating amongst other things. The best kind of heat is um, like sunlight I find, like that actually like feels healing and just generally has a positive effect on people's moods and stuff. Now that we're having better weather I'm generally in less pain than I was when I filmed the last video. Also uh, vitamin D is obviously a thing that separates sunlight from radiators and you do want to make sure you're getting enough of that but I'm going to talk about that more 
in another video. Stick-on heat packs can be pretty good, like this. I use them on uh, my abdomen or lower or upper back. You're not supposed to use them on your abdomen. This would also be a really good opportunity to introduce you to my son. I'll go get him. This is Skylar Brin. He's half hippo, half unicorn, and really into anime. During the winter, I kind of need to sleep with a hot water bottle if I'm on my own, because I'll just freeze and my body will um, go <coughs> otherwise. Professional physical therapy. Depending on whether you can afford it or not, there are various forms of professional help you can get. And again, I would say prioritize your health. Um, if you have a limited amount of money to spend, things that enable you to get by are important enough to spend that money on. I'm just kind of like stressing this because it's that's that's kind of a thing I've had issues with in the past. The obvious one is massage. If you know how to do massages, uh, you can train your carers to do it like I have, but it's still not quite as good as seeing a professional. In the same vein, you can get acupuncture. I personally have found that if it's like, oh, I'm gonna stick a needle in your forehead and it will fix your lower back pain, it doesn't work, but if I go in and I'm like, my jaw is giving me so much grief and then they stick some needles in my jaw, it works really well. So make of that what you will. Physiotherapy, I ha I've had, I've been to a couple of physiotherapists. I I'd say it's good for like learning techniques. There are a couple of techniques that physio people have taught me that have helped me to like strengthen muscles. And again, I'll be going, going over those in the next video. But I mean, a lot of that you can learn on the internet. So it may not be necessary. I, I don't know. I'm just, Again, just my experience. And you probably also want to go to therapy, like just like psychological therapy if you can, just because living with a disability is hard and you're going to have things to talk about. Homebrew, physical therapy. In addition to services that you pay for, there's also a lot of things you can do yourself. Like, I kind of grew up knowing how to do massages because it's just kind of a thing that my family just did on each other. So I just knew how to do it. And I was kind of surprised when I started dating and I'd be like, can you give me a massage? And my partner would be like, I don't know how. But you know, if you don't know, there's lots of tutorials on YouTube and um, there are also ways to give massages even if you have dodgy hands, like I do. If your dodgy hands are giving you a lot of grief, you can try using one of these. So this is a lacrosse ball. It was introduced to me by my friend Hult. I'm gonna plug their channel as they are a queer personal trainer who has set up like a kind of queer space within the gym that they work in. So the idea is like it can just be a space where you don't have to worry about like queer phobia or fat phobia or any of this kind of body policing stuff that can happen within a gym environment. They have some videos on YouTube that are specifically designed for people who have more limited mobility or energy. So I would go check them out if you want to. Their videos are very good and they're um, they're just really good, good person, good human being. The texture of this is basically really good for this kind of thing as it's kind of like, it like has, it's very solid but it has a slight give on, on the exterior and that's kind of what you want from a, a massaging object. You can use it sort of sitting manually, sitting down, um, move your obscene amount of hair out of the way and then you can just kind of like do like little rotations on any area that is painful like that. You can use it on another person as well, like using it just like a, you would with a regular massage, just kind of rolling it up and down a person's back. You always have to be careful with massage not to kind of go on a person's spine, but you'd be especially careful when you're using this because it's a lot more intense and uh, in the same way as you're going to get a lot more intense massage out of, out of this, you're also going to cause more damage to somebody's spine if you like, you know, steamroll across it with one of these. To get to harder reach areas on yourself, you can use the wall or the floor. Like I said, if your mobility doesn't allow for this, you can get someone else to use it on you, but make sure to communicate clearly because it's a lot more intense than a regular massage and more likely to hurt you if it goes wrong. There's also a thing called gua sha, um, which, can I be bothered to go get? I'll go get it, I may as well, I'm doing a video, I should probably get it. This is a gua sha stone. Basically, what you wanna do, I do like eight strokes on kind of each bit. And uh, I guess it works in like a similar way to um, acupuncture or uh, the physio tape. I guess it just gets the blood flowing. It kind of just stimulates like whatever's going on under the skin and, um, and just gets your blood flowing. <sighs> Similarly to acupuncture, again, I kind of don't necessarily think that using it on one area of the body would drastically affect a completely different area of the body. That's never been my experience of 
any kind of treatments like this, but using it on affected areas is really, really helpful. It just kind of, if you wake up and your arms or any other bit of your body just feels a bit kind of dead, this just really helps to just wake it up. It just wakes it all up. It's very nice. There are also a bunch of exercises and things that you can do to strengthen um, the sort of weak muscles that you have and uh, make it less likely that you'll be injured in the first place, but I'm going to talk about those in my next video. Honourable mentions. So my honourable mention for this video is the TENS machine. I don't have one anymore. I did for a while. Um, you can get them on the NHS. Basically, you pay like 20 quid to loan one from, from the hospital. A lot of people who have nerve problems say that they find them useful, but for me, it isn't. Uh, what it is is basically it's just a machine that generates like a weak electrical signal and um, you stick these sticky pads on you and it just like just just electrocutes you a little bit but in a nice way and some people say that they find it really useful. I, I personally didn't notice a significant change using them but it may also have just been because it's a faff to like take out and put away and maybe I just didn't use it diligently enough but definitely something worth looking into if you are someone who suffers from uh, this kind of pain. That's basically it for this video. Um, this, it was going to be a lot longer but like I say I uh, it's just too much and I've chunked it into several more videos that I'm just going to release as and when. I'd say before I go that a really important thing is to make sure you have people around you who understand your condition or at least believe you about it, you know, enough to help you if you need it, if you um, are not like abled enough to carry out some of the stuff that I've said yourself or, or to maybe remember to do it, then having someone else help you with those things can be really, really useful. So try and get that if you can. Even if the other person, even if you're not at a point where you do need that help, just having someone who you can kind of check in with, it's just a big relief uh, to know you're not kind of suffering on your own. Getting comfortable asking for that kind of help is kind of its own whole thing, which I guess I'll address in another video. But for now, I'll just say it's really important to learn how to do so. I hope this was useful. I will see you in the next video, and um, if you are in pain right now, I hope it gets more to a manageable level soon. Special thanks to my monthly coffee supporters. If you would like to help me make more videos, then you can help a lot with that by becoming a monthly coffee supporter yourself. Uh, any amount is very useful. If you can't do that, or you don't want to do that, which is fine, then you can also help me a lot by liking, sharing, subscribing to my channel and leaving a comment on this video. Thank you and I will see you next time.